This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast. A certain little boy was preparing for his piano lesson. The teacher was due at any minute. His mother asked, did you wash your hands? Yes, he said. Your face. Did you wash your face? Yes, mother. Did you wash behind your ears? She asked. Well, the little boy said, I did on the teacher's side. That would be the day she would sit on the other side. You can sometimes fool your piano teacher, your mother, other people with appearances alone. But God sees things the way they really are. Jesus once said how foolish it is to keep the outside of your drinking cup and bowl clean when the inside is filthy. He says, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. What is important is to be spiritually cleansed inside your life by the living love of God, and this inward cleanness will result in an outwardly cleansed life. Sometime when you're washing the dishes, take a dirty glass, turn it upside down under the running water from the faucet, and thoroughly, vigorously clean it on the outside. Then look at the inside, which will still be dirty. Then take another dirty glass and wash it on the inside. Let the water rush into it to rinse it out, and the overflow, the runover, from the inside of the glass will also clean the outside. Just being clean on the outside of your life does not mean that you're spiritually cleansed inside. But if you're clean inside, your whole life is cleansed. You are a son or daughter of God. Believe that. God is your Father. God's spirit within you can renew you every day. The Jewish religion in Jesus' time was critically concerned with cleanness. There were countless ceremonial hand-washing rituals. But Jesus said more important than clean hands are clean hearts. It is written, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. That's what Jesus was talking about. There's a sense of joy and liberation in the finding and knowing of God as a daily personal spiritual experience it is written in the scriptures that god is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap that he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver that he shall purge them as gold and silver cleanness isn't just for outward appearances sake why is everything spotless and gleaming polished and disinfected in a hospital operating room just to be aesthetically pretty? No, but because physical uncleanness results in physical disease, and spiritual uncleanliness results in the spiritual sickness of sin. But if you will ask God for inward cleansing and seek to do God's will, God will make you as new within your heart and soul. Of course, you can tell a lie, and you can act that lie out, but you can't live it out. No person can live a lie and truly be alive. For truly to be alive, you must live truly, true to God and true to others, to God as your father and people as your brothers and sisters in one great planetary family of God. Do you know that every 60 seconds, people in the United States drop 251 tons of trash into their garbage cans so that at the end of the day, 362,000 tons of pure trash have accumulated? The U.S. Public Health Service says, quote, the well-known capacity of the modern city to drown in sewage is more than matched by its talent for smothering itself under a blanket of garbage and refuse. Right there from the U.S. Public Health Service is one of the better descriptions of sin I can conceive, that sin is drowning in one's own sewage and smothering in one's own garbage. Sin is self-centeredness, deliberately refusing to live loyally to God. But God can transform you. God can renew you. The prodigal son ended up sitting in a pig pen. But then Jesus said he came to himself and returned to his father. And so may you, if you will. What if you saw a child of yours sitting in a mud puddle? Would you have him or her get out and take a bath? Or would you Bring that child a bar of soap and tell him to wash up where he was. You could bring him a dozen bars of soap. But if he stayed there in the mud puddle, he or she would stay dirty. So God will do God's part in cleansing of your life, but you have to decide to get out of the mud puddle yourself. It is written, Who shall ascend to the hill of God? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has a pure heart. Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are you when you hunger and thirst after righteousness, goodness, for you will be filled. George Bernard Shaw 
the Irish dramatist, once observed that many a man thinks he is being moral when he is only uncomfortable. End of quote. That's how millions of people think about religion, as an uncomfortable feeling of painful piety, that the surest sign of good character is a furrowed brow. But real religion is joy, because the religion of Jesus is good news, the good news of God's love for you, that you are a son or daughter of God, that God has a plan for your life, a will, and the energy, the spiritual power for the doing of that will. I remember I once heard a frustratingly fascinating discussion about that word news. Is news, N-E-W-S, singular or is it plural? Should a radio or television reporter come on the air and say, here is the news or here are the news? I have personally discovered for myself that the good news which Jesus of Nazareth proclaimed is quite definitely plural. It has countless aspects to it. So it is for everyone, white or black, red or brown or yellow. All people are beloved sons and daughters of God. There are so many dimensions to what Jesus was teaching. And every day you live, you'll discover more of it. Every day, you'll learn more of the delights, the incredible, indescribable joys of knowing God, of practicing the presence of God, of living in a vital companionship certain of God, asking God's will, God's wisdom, God's guidance for the living of your life, and sharing your life with God, talking things over with God. That's really what prayer is. It isn't a formal list of petitions. It isn't some ritualized, obsessive, compulsive behavior of the religious nature, but rather a free and joyous sharing of your life with God. As you do anything you do in your life, as you go through your day saying, let's do it together, a sense of companionship with your heavenly Father who loves you so, who wants good for you. That's the meaning of love. God wants good for every aspect of your life, for everything you do, every thought you think, every action and reaction, everything in your future, everything which is going to befall you. God wants the greatest good because God is your parent and God loves you but trying to satisfy your craving for happiness by serving yourself is like trying to satisfy your craving for food by chewing on your fingernails. True happiness does not come in self-centeredness, but in selflessly serving God by loving and serving human beings. Jesus said, the greatest among you will be the servant of all. It is serving, giving of yourself, forgetting yourself, he who loses himself will find himself, said Jesus. Lose yourself in the greatest cause, the greatest purpose, the greatest rallying cry on this planet, the building of the kingdom of God, serving God and doing God's will upon this earth and in your life. Jesus taught the prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done. The kingdom of God is within you, and if you will align and synchronize your mind and life with that will of God, all things will be transformed. Jesus once told a story about a servant who was forgiven by his master, but who would not forgive his fellow servant. And Jesus used this as a comparison to God. Because God forgives you, you ought also to forgive others. Live in mercy, live in goodness, live in love. Jesus again taught the prayer in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our wrongs, our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us but too many people forget to forgive they simply don't realize that that's a vital aspect of the spiritual life you cannot walk through day after day year after year of your life harboring grudges and bitterness and live in the joy of the love and the goodness of god it doesn't matter how hard you pump the handle if the well is dry and it doesn't matter how hard you try to forgive if you haven't any love in you if you haven't any real forgiving to give just as a dry well must be replenished by the rains from the heavens before it will produce so an empty heart must be replenished by the love of god in order that you will have love and forgiveness to give pray for that gentleness that sweetness of spirit that kindliness that benignness of demeanor so that you are a person doing good on this earth so that you are a trustworthy and forgiving and loving human being you may say, well, there's a person 
that I simply cannot forgive in my life. Well, God can forgive that person. And if God can forgive him or her, then so can you. Because a fragment of God is inside of you. You can forgive another person because God forgives both you and that other person. God has newness of life for everyone. Suppose a father is feeling out of sorts some morning before he goes off to work, and he gives his little boy a scolding for some minor thing this boy has done. Suppose that makes the little boy feel bad, makes that child feel unforgiven, so he becomes a menace for the rest of the morning, taking his feelings out on friends and playmates. Because he's been grouchy to them, they then get out of sorts themselves and start being mean to everybody else, become insolent to their parents, create half a dozen household scenes, all over the neighborhood, and all because one sullen little boy felt unloved and unforgiven by his own father. But this entire world is such a neighborhood as that. And myriad millions of human beings who feel unforgiven and wrong, who feel unforgiven by God, are taking it out on each other every day in meanness and vitriolic hostility. If only humankind could dare to believe the truth that we are loved by God, that God's forgiveness is real and true and reliable and available, how different everything would be, how different life would be, how different we would be. Because a person who knows that he or she is forgiven by his Father God can then forgive other people in greater friendliness. Remember, God forgives you. And if God can forgive you, you must also learn to forgive yourself. Why hold yourself guilty when God does not, because God claims you as his son or daughter in love. And God's future for you, for your life, beginning now, is bright with the joy of forgiveness and of love. And then write to us, will you? We really want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, any and all of this literature. Yours free, without cost, charge, or obligation when you write to us. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell that mailing address, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.